My name is Steve Lubar. I'm the vice president of the Little Compton Historical Society. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker. Um, first, a few words about Zoom, the usual um, mutual update. If you have any questions, uh, put them into the chat. Uh, Jenna Majewski is monitoring the chat and will relay them to the to our speaker. But if you have any technical trouble, um, Jenna will do her best to take care of it. Um, as, as you may know, uh, as many of you know, this is our house tour year. Um, the Little Compton Historical Society house tour just last week was a great success with um, beautiful houses to show off and wonderful attendance and maybe best of all, wonderful weather. Um, thank you to all of us, all of you who joined us. I hope you enjoyed it. It was such a, a beautiful day. Our talks this year continue the theme of houses and homes. Before getting to tonight's talk, let me first give a brief advertisement for our next talk. Uh, next talk is in two weeks, uh, Thursday, October 13th at 7 p.m. It's just on Zoom, not in person. Valerie Talmadge, the Executive Director of Preserve Rhode Island, will talk about the care and keeping of old homes, how to think about maintaining and caring for the historic home. Uh, register at the Historical Society's website to receive a link to the Zoom talk. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. One thing we realized in the course of our house tour organizing was that we were only covering a short period of our history, just the last 350 years or so. And of course, people, the Wampanoag people, have lived in this area for more than 12,000 years. They're still, they still live here. What their homes were and are like is an important part of the historic house history of Little Compton. And that's what we'll be learning about tonight. Darius Coombs, our speaker this evening, is the proud father of four girls, has been married to his loving wife, Toodle, for close to 20 years. He is Mashpee Wampanoag, tribal citizen, and is the cultural outreach coordinator for the Mashpee Wampanoag Education Department. Darius was the director of the Wampanoag Ind Indigenous Program at Plymouth Patuxent Museum for over 30 years, where I might add he did amazing work. Over the course of his career, Darius has worked with the Smithsonian, the History Channel, National Geographic, and Scholastic, to name a few. His teaching of Wampanoag and other indigenous cultures in the history of the Northeast is recognized throughout the country. He is presented at conferences, colleges, historical societies, museums, indigenous institutes, and all grades and levels of learning in North America. Darius is also the recipient of the 2016 New England Museum Association Award for Excellence and the 2021 Bay State Legacy Award. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Little Compton. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jen, for having me at the here in Little Compton. Uh, can everybody hear me? You can't. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Shout it out. Uh, we need a con, everybody. Nikis? Good evening. And Wampanoag, how are you doing tonight? So far, so good? Thank you very much for the lovely um, bio reading. That was a long version. I told him to shorten it, but um, yeah. <laughs> like, that guy seems pretty impressive, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for coming out tonight, uh, being virtual or um, here in person. I appreciate it. I am Nashville Wampanoag. As Steve was saying, I uh, live on Cape Cod. That's my lovely wife in the background there. I'll point her a few times tonight. Tootie of 20 years. Um, this right here, the topic, We've got, we're going to talk about tonight, it's, it's, a, it's we too, but it goes beyond that, right? We too is house in our language, meaning house. We, this language changes over time. 
So you had week two, you had week two, and we're learning as we go. Um, Cause we came that far from losing our language and now we have it back. And now we have fluent teachers today. Um, and that's a lovely friend of mine who passed away, Dave, right there, King, who's an elder. But um, this right here, as, as Steve was saying, we date back a long time and we're still here today. We date back over 12,000 years. How to decide to put a number on how many years we've been here? How many months, how many days, how many hours? But one thing I can tell you, we're still here. We number at one time over 100,000 people. Now, where do we number this, right? We number this all parts of Massachusetts. Like where I'm from is Mashpee. You go past Boston, you go out to a central Massachusetts, you go through parts down here in Rhode Island, right? I'm sure you guys heard of Sakonet. This is where you live, where you live near. And um, you got Mattapoisett, you got Seekonk, you got Pocasset. You got all different indigenous communities all around. And at one time, we probably numbered over 70 Wampanoag communities around Massachusetts, right? Wampanoag is a nation of people. And amongst that nation, over 70 communities, over 100,000 people. So back then, if you're traveling, right? If you go back thousands of years, even hundreds of years, and you go up to somebody and say, hey, what are you? They're not gonna say, um, I'm Wampanoag, because they expect you to know that already, this is Wampanoag country. They will say, I'm a Sakonet, and what are you? And a Sakonet, like I say, is a community, a town of people. So I wanna make sure that that's, that's out there. And we had over 100,000, and today in 2022, there's probably about 15 to 20,000 Wampanoag people living today. Not a big number, right? Unfortunately, we dealt with a lot of disease right before the pilgrims arrived. I didn't put this in my presentation, but I always, you have to speak about it. If, if it wouldn't be fair if I didn't. Back in 1616, there was a plague that came through a major disease that swept from Northern Maine. This was four years before the pilgrims arrived. Northern Maine came down the coastline, went 30, 40 miles inland, and it stopped dead in its tracks by Narragansett Bay down here. For Wampanoag people, it wiped out up to 90% of our people within a two or three year span, okay? This is right before the pilgrims arrived. Now, what was it? Common thought over the years, oh, hepatitis, because the skin turned yellow, people open sores on their body, dying within days, maybe. There's been common interpretation, maybe smallpox. We rule out smallpox. We know in 1623, there was a big outbreak of smallpox. We know in 1633, there's a huge outbreak of smallpox, okay? What disease control came out with over 10 years ago, they believe it's leptospirosis. If you know what that is, that's from French trade ships farther north that came over up in Canada. And on those trade ships, they would have rats. And the rats would get into the water system, their feces, and create an infectious liver disease. And that's what disease control believes. We call it yellow fever. I've always said you can put whatever name you want on it. It doesn't matter to me. What I do know is it was the most devastating thing that ever happened to our people, period. Like I've been doing this type of history research for 35 years. And what we have is a big puzzle, right? And we try to fit, we have all these pieces. We try to fit it together the best we can. But I still don't know fully understand how the traditional and political structure was before contact. Could you imagine nine out of 10 people dying? Imagine the leaders we lost, the medicine people we lost. I can't imagine, it's very hard. So I have to mention that about that disease. And think about that, right? That plague, yellow fever, starts in Northern Maine, parts of Canada maybe, goes down the coastline, goes 30, 40 miles inland, and it stops dead in its track down here. Why, why is that? Any idea? Why not go to Florida? the keys. For us, we have, we have two guesses, right? Disease is hard to go over water. And they stop by Narragansett Bay, so it's hard for disease to spread over. That's, we know, because we know for a fact, Nantucket, the vineyard, um, Cuddy Hunk, Penikees, all those Elizabeth Islands weren't affected by that disease as much. Also, there were Narragansetts and Wampanoag, a lot of families didn't like each other. How big that conflict was, we don't know. But if you don't like a group of people, you don't have that physical back and forth with each other. 
I'm sure the leaders down here, maybe Canonicus, right, were probably looking at us, hmm, whatever that is, I don't know what it is. But I see the Wampanoag people dying off. I'll let it take its toll and we'll see what happens. And that's what happened. After he found out we were being died up, killed off by that plague, that's when some attacking started happening. Um, that's what, that needs to be said right there. So Jen, I just move along with this right here. Okay, like I said, we've been over 12,000 years. We're still here today. Parts of Mass a large parts of Massachusetts. Um, I mentioned some of the communities, Nantucket, Nauset, uh, Sakonet, Pocasset. They've taken on town names today, but they've always been Wampanoag communities, period. I want to start you guys out, right, on a short 13 moon cycle before we get too much into the houses. Um, the houses, right, it's, it's special to me. Like I was director for a long time and that's my love right there, houses, right? It's not just building them. It's also, I think it's more, what I get out of it more is making these wee twos. As I go to different indigenous communities around North America, I've been to Ontario to re-gift that to the Delaware up there. The Delaware are people who were originally down in Jersey and they got relocated after 1830 Removal Act to Ontario, a lot of them did. And they lost that way of material culture. And it was, I was proud to reintroduce, reintroduce that to them. The Piscataway down in Maryland, the Mohegan in Connecticut, the Pequot. And I'm gonna touch on that a little bit for, for, toward the end and what we did. But I wanna start you with our, our New Year's cycle, right? Our 13 moon cycle, which is our New Year's. I'm gonna stop halfway to, through too, guys. So you guys got questions, think about the questions as we go. And I'll stop and answer. For you folks out on, too, on Zoom too, Get some questions ready. So for a lot of people around the world, right? New Year starts January 1st. Our New Year starts when everything comes to life. And you think about that, when does everything come to life? When do the birds start chirping? When do the flowers start coming out? When do the herring start to run upstream? That's springtime, right? It just makes sense. It's not exactly the same every year. It's usually sometime in early May, but each year is a little bit different. So when you see these signs of nature, you thank Mother Earth, you thank the Creator for having another year because it's not always guaranteed, all right, for anybody. And that's when you see a lot of dancing being done. You see a lot of socializing being done. We're, for us, we're a very talkative group of people. We enjoy each other's company. We do a lot of socializing still today. We joke around quite a bit. I do at least. <laughs> But so after New Year's is over, right? We're seasonal people. So what we do, we live near the ocean, right? We want to live near the ocean, near the rivers. Yeah, that's where we get a lot of our fish and that's where we do a lot of our planting. We go to this slide, slide, slide right here and you got different people's responsibilities, right? It's a good friend of mine. I think Matt dancing in the background. But for the woman's responsibilities during the spring and summer, they would do the planting. The women give life to babies, so they also give life to Mother Earth. So they do the planting of the corn, the beans, the squash. Um, a lot of people don't realize over 60% of what we ate was considered to be vegetables and still is a lot today. Almost every meal you would have, you probably would have some type of corn with it. Very, very big. Now, when do you plant corn? When do the women do this? You do this when, um, you have to wait for different signs in nature. Once you like to see the shad bush start to bloom, once you see the oak leaf as big come, becomes as big as the squirrel's ear, once you see the herring start to run, you wait until the next new moon. The new moon, because when you plant a corn, the new moon will draw gravity up. So it helps that corn seed grow. Okay, once the corn gets about hand high, corn takes nitrogen out of the ground, you plant beans next to it, and beans will wrap around the stalk of the corn. The beans will feed the um, ground nitrogen also. And you plant the squashes on the bottom of the mound. Um, and a squash leaf itself is a, is a large leaf, which they will shade the ground to keep the ground soft. It's kind of like, if you guys ever been out to the Midwest, that's how we live during the spring and summer. I compare it like that because if you're out, out in the Midwest, right, you see a farmhouse, you drive up road a little bit more, you see fields. There's another farmhouse. If you're out in the machine, if you guys don't know what a machine is, machine is a boat in our language. 
if you're looking on shore, that's what you would have seen. You would have seen during the spring and summer, houses like that right there, cattail map covered houses, and all around the house you would see cornfields. You paddle up river a little more, see there's another cattail map covered house and more cornfields. You live within shouting distance of each other, but bottom line, you needed your space for planting. A planting site for one family would probably take up about an acre or two of land. So you, need, you had vegetables year round. You dry them out so you'd have them during the winter. But that's a distance chart for one of our wheat trees right there, our summer houses. Yeah, that's my lovely wife again. There you are, Tootie. And that's me right there. And this is what we did also during, still do today. This is one thing that has not been interrupted for our culture. And some things have been interrupted and some things have been stopped, not encouraged to do, be practiced, right? We have a lot of people still fish today. Uh, a lot of people still hunt today. And you think about fishing, that was considered to be men's responsibility and still is today. The men are considered to be the altars of life. We take life, right? But we also do ceremony behind that. So if you take the life of a fish, you offer tobacco, you do a prayer for that, life is given up for you. That's, that's one thing when we, what we always think of, we still do it today. We don't put ourselves above or below any form of life. And that's animal life, that's plant life, that's human life. We're all equal, period. And that's one common bond every indigenous nation going across North America has. That's how we think about life. And there's over 500 nations going across North America who are indigenous. The different types of fish we have, we have, they say we have so much flounder, you walk out on the beach at low tide and spear flounder, right? We could tail the horseshoe crab spear. We had so much um, cod, you could walk right to Provincetown on the codfish. So much um, lobster, walk down the beach at low tide and pick up lobster off the beach. Lobster was considered to be fishing bait for our people. Not a big deal. We ate it, not a big deal. Um, we had so much of it. Even going back 100 years ago, lobster was fed to prisoners in jail almost every single day. And the prisoners had a big uprising. They were so sick of it, they didn't want it anymore. They go, come on, enough, enough, right? So the state of Massachusetts made a law that you only could feed lobster to prisoners twice a week. If you did it any more than that, it was considered to be inhumane. Times changed. Even the pilgrims didn't like lobster. Back in 1623, Governor Bradford had this big ship come in. He goes, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. This is all we have is the lobster to give you guys. So it didn't become a big deal until lately. But uh, we were fishing our machine. Our machine would be anywhere from a one-man boat, to boats big enough to carry 40 men, in which we would go to Nantucket Island. Nant um, machine, one-man boat. I mean, it's a 40-man boat being 60 foot long, six foot wide, one tree probably chestnut or white pine, and all burnt out. And I, a lot of people say, how is that? How can you make a 60-foot boat that would hold 40 men, two men abreast out of one tree? You have to put yourself back in time. We had white pines around the area over 150 foot in height. They were the biggest, six to eight foot around. The chestnut, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in detail today, was a, probably the most plentiful tree you would have seen. And those were probably 100, I should say the, yeah, the most plentiful, but not really the biggest, the pines were the biggest, we think. But the chestnuts would grow about 120 foot high, we think. And they say the woods are so dense around here that a squirrel can jump limb to limb all the way up the main with no problem. But they've been, the king said he owned every tree with four foot in diameter. A lot of trees were taken down and a lot of disease hit the trees and they died when it comes to the elm and chestnut. <clears throat> All right, kids. Kids can do. Like these are two, two of my kids, really. My youngest right there. And they, kids back then during the spring and summer, and year round, they would be listening and learning. Like you got Tash and Storm, that's their names. One's picking a sumac berry, the other one's trying to pick a sumac berry. But they also play a lot. You see a lot of playing going on. Kids weren't given a lot of responsibility at all, you know? And also, kids would be given four or five, six different names in a lifespan. As you would change yourself as a person, your names would change also to fit how you are. So you wouldn't be stuck with one name going off throughout your life. Okay? And depending on yourself, like you got Tashima up there, right, Tootie? What Tashima means is one who lifts up. 
It's not because she's big and physical and strong, but Tashma wakes up in a good mood almost every single day. And when she wakes up in a good mood, everybody feels good. Almost every single day. There are those days. But like I say, you go through numerous different names and we don't go by numbers, one, two, three, four, five years old. And their responsibility is to listen to the elders, the storytelling, because it's up to next, that generation to pass those stories down. And they also have a lot of fun, which they still like doing today. They pick strawberries, as you can see right there. And part of our 13 moon cycle is we have our strawberry festival, strawberry moon in June. And that's when we sell, that's the very first berry that comes out and we celebrate that uh, strawberry dancing, singing, socializing. <clears throat> this right here is, um, I'm gonna go into a little bit about the houses first, right? Right off the bat and how we, what we use for building our houses for our frames of our houses are made out of white cedar. You can use white cedar, you can use hickory, you can use maple. I use them all. And the best one I find is the white cedar. Any idea why? Rot resistant. Cedar is gonna last, I don't know, 10, 20 years in the ground without rotting easily. You know, and what we do, we cut the cedars down, then we strip the bark off of them. And what we do with the bark is we make mats into them. We also use the bark for lashing with the trees. And we take the cedars and we burn the ends of the cedars about three feet up. The way, if you ever been to a cedar swamp, right? It's different from, white cedar is a lot different from red cedar. Red cedar tapers off really quick. White cedar doesn't taper off as much. It can go 30, 40 foot up in the air and very slowly it's a taper. And that's what you want. Because when you're building your houses, right? You need long, long poles to do your frames of the houses. Um, people always ask me, where's your blueprint for these houses? I said, it's right here. It's right here. I've been taught from certain elders, good friends of mine over the years, the Nana Pashmans, Daryl Wixons, um, and they taught me how to do these houses. And think about the frames of the houses, as you can see right here. This is, these, this is the interior frame, right? All that bark you see hanging around, that's all I think where we roof in that house right there. We're using a lot of the old bark and new bark mixed together. But you see a couple of guys doing our lashings here. How, our houses can be just as small as, I don't know, if during the spring and summer, you're looking at six to eight people living in one of those houses, that would be maybe 16 foot around. How we live during the spring and summer is a lot different during the fall and winter in our bark covered houses, but our cattail mat covered houses, you might have your grandparents, parents, live, um, children, aunts and uncles living with you. Very, like, it's, it's like that today a lot of time in our community, extended families. And this, this right here, the bottom left is the size of a, probably a house that's 16 foot around. And like I said, you see the bark has always been stripped off, right? You never go on to see the white cedar swamp and cut down the pole and leave it there. Then thinking, oh, I'm gonna come back in a month. You never do that because it's gonna dry. It's gonna dry. If you're not gonna use it right away, you put those white cedars in fresh water into rivers, into the pond, so they'll hold moisture, right? And, the first, very first thing you do is before what you see here, this stage is you lay out your footprint. It's like any house, you want your foundation laid out. So the first thing I do, I, I'll get, I'll ask who I'm making it for and how big, how big a family, how big do you want it? Then I'll get some wooden pegs, branches, get a handful of those and pace it out, you know? They're usually round, oval. Um, for the summer houses, like 16 foot around is a common size. I'll peg it out. Then I'll dig the holes in the ground for the, where the poles are, are gonna go. Now the, the holes in the ground for the foundation, the holes are about, I don't know, probably about six inches around, going down about 30 inches, okay? And you wanna pick an area of ground that's high so the water goes down. Okay, the, I can tell you, this is the most common mistake, mistake people make when they're building wee -tubes. I've done it when I first started out is so they start with their holes in the ground first right 
what they do is they plant one pole on one side, one pole on the other, and you got to have strings up there so you can pull it down, right? And when they they pack it with dirt and stone, but they're straight up and down, see? So when they're pulling them, it caves in because of the pressure. What you want to do, what I do, works, it works really well, is you kick them out when you plant them. When you plant them 30 inches down, you kick them out at an angle like you see there. Then you pack the front of them. And because of the pressure, it caves in just enough to form that perfect arch. Okay? It's a science. It's a science. You got to know that, right? And what you do, you have your arches, your two main ones that will form your smoke hole on the very top. Then as you go down, you drop down. And that's how you get the round shape. A common frame, interior frame for a house is probably you have maybe eight arches or six arches, two that you're highest, then you drop down a little bit, drop down. Then you have the ones that go over the top, like you see there, the four. And you have your rings, like you see on the bottom right, that tie everything together. And once you have your frame built, it kind of looks like a, a jungle gym. You guys ever been to a kid's playground? That's what it look kind of it kind of looks like. You never leave the bark on because it, it forces it to rot quicker. And yes, like I said, the cedar bark you can use for making baskets, mats, and also you can use for um, lashing for your house. You boil it up, it makes a great, great lashing. So you build your frame, right? You got your interior frame built. And what you're looking for, right? Now you got to roof it, okay? How you roof a, um, what you used to, to roof a summer house is cattails. I'm sure you guys have these around here too, right? They're everywhere. Now you got the brown fluffy part up top. And for us as Wampanoag people, we use that brown fluffy part for a baby's diaper. We break it up as, as it's a natural exorbit. My granddaughter, Wiggy, right? We're gonna give her some of those, right? And what we do with the cattail itself, I don't have a cattail reed in front of me right now, but you can see them. I want you guys to go out in the next few days and look at these cattails, right? Look, look closely at these cattails. The reed itself, it has a natural cup to it, okay? And that's why we use the cattail. We cut them down in August and September, which we still do today. In August, September, yeah. Um, we cut them down, we split them. We tie them up in very small bundles and we dry them out on drying racks for about two to three weeks in the sun. Then once they're totally dried, that's when we start making them into mats. You can see a mat down the bottom right, you see there. It's very, it's not something you just go and pick a reading and you go do. You gotta know what you're doing because when you're making these mats, which I, my wife, many others have made over the years, is you gotta soak the reed, we soak it, then you do a woven stitch up top, right? You do a woven stitch up top. You said I have a pointer on this? Okay, thank you. So you get your woven stitch up top. Every foot down, you do a running stitch, okay? Very important, right? And so, like, if you get a one running stitch, two running stitch, this, we, this match should have more, more running stitches, but one, Two, you keep the cattail reed the same facing up, right? Same, you don't, you don't twist it. The third row, between the second hair and the third, you half twist the cattail, then continue running stitches down. They should have five rows, right? And by half twisting the cattail reed itself, what happens, that forms into a funnel. So when it rains, it comes right down, right? And, and normally for a 14 to 16 foot house going around, we usually use 26 mats. What we do, we do 13 mats, different layers over, overlapping. Then we put a second layer on that. And every year we do a rotation. We take the old ones off, put the new ones closer, new ones on, so. And the, the mats themselves, it's a different way of, of building today because our mats today don't last as long because they because acid rain and such. So they'll get, maybe get three to five years out of it. Back then you get a little bit longer. But when you go back to your winter community, that's when you store a lot of these mats, either bring them with you after harvest time or we'll store them in the ground. And this is an art that still, that regain, we regained and we almost lost it. But we, we actually asked the, um, 
the Kickapoo down in the Southwest who never lost that way of doing things of cattail mat making back in the early 70s to reinduce it for us and we retired ourselves with them. So. so that's what you use during the spring and summer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'll show the interior of a house, right? Now this right here is the bottom right, is the interior of a cattail, average size, 14 to 16 foot around. You can see the interior frame here, right? The rings and such. And you can see the cattail mats up here. What these are right here, these mats are different. These are bulrush mats. I've done a lot of material culture over the years. I've cut bulrush down, they, they come, they live in marshy areas. I've never woven a mat. I don't have that much patience. So one, mat takes, takes, one mat takes a woman about two months to do one mat. The hand, it's all hand woven. It's all hand woven. You dye it with different colors of berries, roots. Then you do, you start up top, you do a woven and you weave it all the way down. And the reason we have these bulrush mats on the walls, they add decoration, but they also add insulation. Because when you build the fires, right, heat's gonna rise. And because of the way the house is shaped, it's round, heat's gonna go up, go down underneath the mats, force the cold there onto the fire, and keeps the warm air circulating around. When the pilgrims first got here, they would go inside of our houses. They, they, would, write, they would write down, they would see whopping out children running outside naked during the winter and jumping into the snow. Our houses really get, I, I know, I know I build these, I, they get really warm. They get as warm as you want them to get, period, okay? Extremely warm. And what you see here is the beds. Now this right here is stick bedding, which is common, but we also have plank bedding, flat cedar boards. And think about the plank bedding. I don't know if that was part of hierarchy, but we know Massasoit, who lived out in Bristol, Warren, what we know as Poconoke for my people. We know they say mentioned Massasoit's bed as being plank, cedar planks which is pretty impressive. But this is, we, we would keep warm during the cold, cooler days, during the spring and summer. We heat our houses, we cook in here right by the fire pit. Uh, it also gives out light. And up the very top, you see smoke, a smoke hole. You can see my buddy Philip there. We got furs on the beds. We got deer, we got skunks. You guys like the taste of skunk? No, never had, ever had it? Would you like to try? Skunks are whopping out delicacy. You know how you catch a skunk? Very carefully, right? Two boys. One boy being in front of the skunk distracting him. You get the other boy that'll sneak upon him from behind. He will grab his tail, lift him off the ground. In order for a skunk to spray, he has to be on all fours, putting pressure on his hind legs to release the stink glands. You get him up there, he can't do that. You knock him out and very carefully cut his stink glands on. There's nothing wrong to me. Tastes like chicken. It's a sweet, sweet meat. But that's what you see back here. You see a skunk mantle. You gotta have furs, you gotta have mats on the bed for comfort, of course. And these houses are very comfortable. Well furnished, cradle board up here, bags, a bowl, whatever. So that's what the interior of a house looks like in all different sizes. Like I said, a spring and summer house will be maybe 14, 16 foot around. When I talk about a fall, fall and bark covered house, it's a whole lot different. Those were a whole lot bigger. The light from the fire. We was normally rule of thumb, yet yeah, summer houses probably only have one fire pit because they weren't that big. We had bigger houses, which I'm going to talk about, which could have 10, 20, 30 fires inside. When you're inside this house, these houses, right, the types of wood you would burn are hard wood and they're in their season wood. So you don't have that sap. You don't have any moisture, so you have very minimum smoke. And also, you would have the door totally closed. So you don't have that draft coming inside. So whatever smoke you do have goes straight up to the smoke hole. Yeah. And we have a smoke hole on the very top for every fire pit. Rule of thumb, when you're making these houses, every 10 foot or so, you want to have a fire pit and you want to have a smoke hole. And what you have on the very top of the roof, which I don't have a picture of today, but you have a flap that can be that can go all around the hole itself. It could be made from a cattail mat. It could be made from bark. 
And that mat right there, that flap, depending on the wind, right, it's adjustable. So if the wind's blowing this way, you put your flap up like that, and that blocks up the rain, the wind, from forming a downdraft, but at the same time allows the smoke to go straight up and out. It all depends on the wind. <clears throat> okay. It gives you another idea what a frame looks like. That's a fully roofed outside on the bottom right house, cattail mat house. You, you see the exterior frame, right? So you got your interior frame, you put your mats on, then you have your exterior frame that clamps the mats on, so hold it in place. And you can use um, string, like you use a cedar bark. You can use spruce root. You can use hickory bark, but you can use string too. A lot of people don't realize, I mentioned to people, folks, I go, you know, we had string. They go, you guys had string? I'm like, yeah, we did. We made string from different types of plant fibers. We use milkweed, we use dog bane. We use the inner bark of a basswood tree. You take those fibers out, right? You weave them together and that's how you get your string. Although it's mainly used for weaving, it's considered to be very valuable. So the lashing probably would have been hickory bark or cedar bark or spruce root. So the mat stays in place. You see that house too, right? It's round. Do you see any corners on that house? Where do you think the wind's going to go? Right around. Now I'm going to date myself. I'm sure you folks remember this storm that came up the coast. Hurricane Bob, 1991, right? The last major devastating hurricane to hit, at least where I lived. And I was working that day, and we had houses like you see here. And those houses weren't taken down. House, the wind went right around those houses, right? And I was also watching um, the, what, the Weather Channel one time, right? And they were down the Keys during a major hurricane. Every house down there was taken down. And they were driving around one of those big old Weather Channel trucks that were uh, hurricane proof. That thing was shaking. And they saw one house standing, right? It was a, a dome shaped house. So they actually went up to the folks, knocked on the door, said, Can we come in? <laughs> this is the Weather Channel, right? So they went in, the, it was an architect who built the house. He lived there. He built a dome shape, just makes sense. When you have hurricanes hitting you every almost every year, you want something for the winds flow. And that was the only house that stood up. <clears throat> I'm gonna bring you this map right here before I start talking about the fall and winter. This is the 1605 Samuel Champlain map that he made. Everybody's heard of Samuel Champlain, the French explorer. He came into Plymouth, what is known as Plymouth Bay, right? What we call Patuxet by us as Wampanoag people. He came in with his ship and he came amongst Wampanoag people. They came out in their machine ashes to greet him. This is before plague hit in 05, 1605. And they did some trading. Champlain said the Wampanoag people gave him rope. And he was so fascinated at the rope, how strong it was. He compared it with what he had over France. They invited him in for some food, but his boat was too heavy, couldn't make it upstream. But the reason I like this map, it gives you an idea, see how it is, how the houses are? The round map covered houses along the shore, along the river, you got the cornfields, and that's how we lived during the spring and summer. He also, Champlain, made a trip back in 06, the area again, he went on Cape Cod. He went in a place which is called Chatham, and it's what we call Matamoya. And there was a, fight that broke out down there. What the Wampanoag people were doing, it was the end of the harvest time, so they were taking their mats off, and there was a little confusion. So the French soldiers, soldiers went on to the Champlain's men, went on to Montemoyac, fight broke out, French people died. He headed to what is known as New Bedford today, but on the way back, he retaliated and made the people die, unfortunate. So he actually made two trips around this area, 05 and 06. But this, is a, this map is very, very famous. Um, so I want to stop right there. So, so you guys have any questions <clears throat> before we start talking a little bit about the fall and winter? Holmes, yes. OK, go ahead. It's not like it's getting to it, but there was very much seasonality. Yeah. Yeah, so we're talking summer. about the seasonality of housing. Yeah, living for thousands of years like that. New Year's, springtime, come out near the ocean, come out near the rivers, do your planting, do your fishing, live in your cattail match covered houses, give yourself distance away from each other for family so you'd have planting grounds. 
if you notice one year, <clears throat> the planting the ground's not coming up as well as the year, the year before, common sense will tell you to move on. But move on, it might be right over here. It might be right next door, not that far. So you don't live, people used to interpret, okay, they lived away from each other. No, you live within shouting distance of each other. You needed your space for planting. You needed an acre or two of land. Then after, after harvest time is over, you dry your crops out and you go inland. And we'll get into that. You go inland away from the ocean, away, you get away, get, away, get away from that wind. Inland might be a half mile, maybe a mile. You're looking for a large sediment of woods or a very, very steep valley to move into. Okay, get away from that wind chill factor. And that's when we live in these big communities that hold, they'll hold anywhere from 300 to 3,000 people. As far as we know, we don't know this for a fact, but as far as we think we know, Poconoke in Bristol was the biggest community, at least the time 1620 rolled around. And that community had over 3,000 people in it. And the leader of that community was Master Slate. Master Slate, the great Wampanoag leader, right? That's how he's portrayed. I'm not saying he wasn't. <laughs> I'm not saying he wasn't at all, but that's who the pilgrims dealt with. And that's who they wrote about a lot. We know the 69 or 70 communities. We know the names of the leaders of those communities. But that's who Plymouth Colony dealt with was Massachusetts community, Poconoke. A lot of people don't realize that. When the colonists arrived in 1620, Massachusetts came out two days walk to see what was going on. Because disease was devastating, you know. There was pockets in there of communities not living anymore. But he's the one that made treaty with the English before anybody else did. But it was only with Plymouth Colony and Poconoke. We know for a fact there are other Wampanoag leaders that did not like the pilgrims being here. People say, why? I'll tell you, I can tell you why very easily. How you treat the pilgrims when they first got here, it depended on how you treated yourself by European traders, fishermen, and enslavers. If, and this is nothing, something I, I make up myself. This is something they wrote down. If your brother got taken, that was normal for them. If your brother got taken as a slave, you're not going to be open arms for other people coming in. So. Yeah. Well, so we we're have, explaining the map. What we have, you got this is the Plymouth Bay. This right here is the bay going in. This is right, this part here is what we call the Eel River. It goes up. It goes into different ponds and lakes also. Um, these are fathoms. I'm not sure. I'm not too good with water, the, the depths of the water and such. Uh, what you see here are the cornfields. That's a house that we do. Cornfields, house. So the reason I like this map gives you an idea of how we lived during the spring and summer. So the corn were very uh, planted very close to each other. This is why he grew. <laughs> but it, uh, obviously you don't see the the beans and the squash and the watermelon that's going to show up on the map. Mm -hmm. But you no, know, you planting mounds, planting mounds. Mm -hmm. But you need a little bit of space. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions before we go on? Yes. I'm just curious. I'm assuming that you didn't read the New York Times or something about any sort of thing on your So the question is were there herbicides or pesticides? <laughs> <laughs> How do the strawberries look so red? <laughs> hey, Google. Google. <laughs> Photoshop, Photoshop. <laughs> no, the strawberries are very plentiful. Well, that's, a, that's the number one. I don't know. I, didn't, I don't know how it was back then. I, I don't know. Uh, you got me hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> but strawberry, we had strawberry festivals to celebrate that strawberry. <laughs> we have wild strawberries growing all over. We bring our tribal kids out picking blueberries, wild blueberries, strawberries all throughout the year. Yeah, they're really good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. they're you asking. Could, you could either about... or. You could either, before you went back to your fall and winter community, you would store your mats in the ground in storage pits. That would go maybe eight to 10 foot down in the ground. And that's where you stored a lot of your vegetables. So when you came back in the spring, you would have something to eat. That's what the pilgrims found their first winter when they got here. They found that on Cape Cod, native storage pits full of dried corn. But you could also store your mats or you could bring them inland with you. And if you brought them inland, they could be used for 
padding for your beds or added installation? Get out of the you, they say, yeah, I don't know, around five. Yeah. So yeah, that's how many? Then the storage, yeah. Yeah, yeah you want to go, because you got food there too. You want to go yeah. way down before the animals can smell, so. And, and you would you would not that part of the is kind of dry. It's still dry, yeah. Yeah. yeah we still the we we you plant on a hill uh, uh, the height area. <coughs> so the, but you bound it over too, so you know where, where it was. So so we so came you, back. So you said how long would they last in the pit? Well the, well if you if you if you buried the mats. You don't leave them there. You know, during mm -hmm. the spring you dig it right. up and you reuse the mats. So they'll last probably around five years like that. When after, um, after you relocated for the fall, were the frames, the wheat tubes come down or they would stay? Frames are permanent. Yeah. Either, either bark houses or mat houses, frames are permanent. And the, the frames will last, like I said, for 20 years. Every year you do a little tuning up, tighten up a, a strap, uh, a strap with the intercross and such. But no, they last about 20, 20 years. Cedar takes a lot of time to rock in the ground. Actually, like I say, you burn the ends too, about three feet up. Part that goes in the ground, there. that'll give you added a couple of years. All right. So this is a village community in the way we will live in during the fall and winter, go inland. I doubt you would have seen the Palisade. There was no, there's, they found a Palisade down in Cape Cod in one of the communities. That was post-contact though. You definitely saw that down in Connecticut during the Pequot Massacre in 1636, though. Hunting was very big. It's my buddy, Tim. He, he loves the camera, that boy. He might be listening. Hi, Tim, if you are. But um, hunting was a very big part during the winter. Like, we're considered to be the life takers. So the four big animals we would go for, we go for deer, we go for black bear, we go for moose, we go for elk. Um, there were elk and beer around here one time. And, and moose. You see Tim there with the long bow. The long bow itself will be made out of hickory wood or ash wood. And you want to use hickory or ash because it has a straight grain going up and down the wood. So it's very strong. Think about bow making, right? You get the straight grain wood. Suppose in the middle what a handle is, you're going to be about eight layers of wood, right? When you go to the right and you go to the left, you want it to be equal. So if you get down here to be four layers of wood, you want that down here to be four layers of wood. If it's not equal, when you draw back that bow, it's going to snap on you. Every, every pot has to be equal left to the right. <clears throat> and what we use for the string for the bow, I tell kids all the time, if you feel right behind your knee, you feel that part that feels like an elastic, it's called a sinew. And use that for um, stringing a bow. We can also use that for sewing thread and such. So sinews are very valuable for our people. That's one way of hunting. Another way of hunting is using deadfall traps for black bear. You dig big holes in the ground, you put wooden spikes coming up, right? And the black, and then you put brush over the hole and you put food on that brush. So the black bear come along going for that food and fall right into the hole. Another way is using snares, very small snares, traps, very large snares for deer. Young trees bent over with a trigger system hooked up, right? The deer will come along, set that trigger off and he launch up in the air. Back in 1620, before he became governor, William Bradford was walking through the woods on Cape Cod. Going for a leisure walk, right? Guess what he stepped on? Stepped on a deer snare. And he got launched up in the air. He was all right. He became governor and lived a long life. But he complained about how sore his hip was. You know, so he pulled him up really quick. And you heard me talk about the small animals we would hunt for, the rabbits, the skunks, uh, turkeys, beavers, otters, goose, partridge, quail. We only would go for animals that ate berries and greens. We wouldn't go for animals that ate meats. That meat, that, that meat wasn't that great. So we knew that. Still do. This are my auntie up there, elders. You cannot talk, do a talk without talking about the elders because those are the teachers. Those are the ones who've been there, done that. And those are the ones who carry on the stories. And they have a lot of stories, especially Auntie Shirley has plenty of stories. Make you laugh, make you cry. But everything she says means something. When I talk to her, I listen to every word she has to say. She's um, 
clan mother, we have a lot of clan mothers in Mashpee. And to bottom right, that's Comey Wild Horse, a very well-known elder for a weaving. You see the weaving over here, and that's what the woman would do a lot during the fall and winter. We are known as Wampanoag people for our weaving. Our weaving today is at the National Museum of American Indian at down in Smithsonian down in Washington, DC. So that's some, some of the things we do. And that right there, that bag right there is a bushel bag. And that's what you would have seen in the ground in storage pits. Large bushels full of corn and beans, huge bags. I have not seen that woman to the bottom right call me ever walk around without a weaving, either a belt or a bag. That's part of who she is. <clears throat> this is our winter style houses, guys. Is, is tree bark, right? Now you can see the interior frame is the same thing. The interior frame is made out of cedar. <clears throat> we got ties going around the inside. That's the bottom right picture right there. Is um, you have the frame scale. You start out high, then you drop the arches down low. Then these ones go right over the top. Then you get your rings that tie everything together. And eventually you have beds all around the inside. Well, the bark right you see here, you see the exterior frame like a cattail mat, right? Then the bark is in the middle, okay? Now, talking about bark, that's right here is the, the chestnut tree, right? Chestnut and elm were the two most popular barks that we would use for our roofing, okay? There's only a certain time of year when you get the bark off the tree. Any idea what time of year that is? Springtime, right, exactly. And you can't run up to Home Depot and buy bark, right? <laughs> well, you can buy most here, I guess. But bark, right? What happens in the springtime, the blood of the tree runs being the sap. So you got wood, you got tree bark. Sap goes up, separates the two. Cut around the bottom, cut around top, slice down the middle, and it peels right off. It's a system the way you do this, right? You don't go peeling your bark, then build your frame. That doesn't make any sense. I've seen people do it before though. What you wanna do is build your interior frame first, then go out and get your bark. Because what happens when you get that bark off the tree, it has, it has a lot of moisture inside of it, a lot of sap. So you can put it right onto the frame and mold it the way you want. And that's for the elm and chestnut. What they are, they're basically big shingles, right? You never, I went to a museum, the State Museum in Albany, right? And I walked in that museum, and they had a wigwam, they called it, we two, same thing, house. See how this bark is put up down, up and down like that? They had the sheets of bark going this way. <laughs> That's, it was indoors, I don't know. I don't, it was indoors, but you should got to have the right way, because if you have it going this way, the grain of the bark goes the same way. So when it rains, it holds that moisture in. What these are, are shingles, big shingles. You start at the bottom. You overlap it all the way up to the top. You probably do about maybe a foot, foot and a half overlap. That's the same way, you interior frame, the exterior frame clamps the bark on until you get the very top. I like doing the top myself, I've done so many, is because that's when you show your talent because you do a lot of fanning when it comes to the corners and it looks really, really pretty once it's completed. I think my buddy made this one, Anna Juan. Yeah, he does a nice job. But the two main barks you'd use as elm and chestnut, you'll get that bark during a certain time of year. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we had the chestnut disease come through, blight. And we also, for the elm, back in the early 1900s, there was a ship of fruit that came over from the Orient, and they had a bug in that fruit, and it wiped out the elms, the elm disease. So what we use today in 2022, because I, I peel back almost every single spring and early summer, we use two of poplar. Tulip poplar is a really thick bark, a really good bark to use. And that's found down in Connecticut, South, Delaware, Maryland, Jersey. That's the best I've used. I also use white ash. But if, I don't know if you guys heard about the emerald ash bug going around. That's totally wiping out the ash trees. Whole counties have been quarantined about that. But those are the two best I found out. Somebody said, oh, you can use hemlock too. So I went out and used hemlock. I roofed a house and next year it fell apart. It's, a, it's a related to the pine tree. The bark ain't that great. It dries up really quick. You can break it off with your finger. Yeah. What um, do you do with the trunks then was the question. Machine ashes. 
uh, making mortars for grinding corn, spoons, not firewood, everything's used. Everything. And how you take down a tree, right, is by burning. If you burn, you'll burn down the tree, either to make the boat or if you want the bark off the tree. And the way you do that is you have a clay layer that goes about eight foot above the trunk of the tree. You build a fire underneath and that way the fire will not extend up the tree. So you burn right where you want to burn. So it's this focus burn, right? Then you chip away and the tree's going to fall. The only picture of we have of a, of a person, of a native person peeling bark is a woman. And that's, we don't see, we have no pictures of men doing it. I've done it for years. I know it's really difficult. My wife has done it. I brought some women out to lumber yards to do a peel. It's a lot of physical labor, it's a lot. Because when you peel that bark off, it still has a lot of moisture, all that sap inside of it. So it takes maybe three guys to carry a six foot of sheet, three or four guys and stack it. And when you stack it, you never do it the same thing. You want to crisscross it. And the reason you crisscross it is so it doesn't curl up. You want it to have flat, be flat. And eventually, one day, if you're on the lumber yard peeling bark, we go to lumber yards today, you might have a stack of bark this high, say. When you come back the next day, you have it this high. Because after those 24 hours, it weighs itself down. It's going to be per become perfectly flat. Then you bring it back to you, you have a community, and you, you put it on your house. Bark houses will last. <clears throat> Today, the bark gets about maybe an inch thick, inch and a half. Back then, you're looking at three to five inches thick. Trees are a lot, lot bigger, as we know, 120, 150 foot in height. Now, our houses during the winter would be anywhere from 100 to 200 foot in length, would hold 10, 20 families on the inside, probably being somehow related on the inside. We're a matrilineal society, so we go through our woman's line, right? And like I said, every 10 foot or so, you want to have a fire pit on the inside, and that's for warmth, to keep you warm. Um, now, we found there was a footprint of a house <clears throat> that was found out in central Massachusetts around the Grafton area, Worcester, right? And that's where the Wampanoag people end, and that's where the monk people begin. And that house was 300, like I said, we found the footprint, 320 foot in length and 60 foot in width. I tell folks, if you're not good with numbers, think of a football field. And that's how, this, how big this house was. In my opinion, it was more than a house. It was more, I would guess, like a community center. Because that's when you see nations beaten right there. It just makes sense. And yeah, royalty would have bigger houses. Massachusetts so would have a bigger house. The chiefs, the council would have bigger houses. Because, because they have to do the same thing people do today. They have a lot of guests, so they need that space. Uh, let's I, I, like I said, you heard me in the beginning say I've done a lot of projects, which I'm very proud of doing. I've gifted back what I've learned to different nations on their material culture and how to do houses. Um, back in 1997, I want, or six, 97, I was quite young, just learning. That's when the Pequot Museum started happening, Foxwood happened, right? And the Pequot signed in Connecticut wanted a museum. And they contacted me directly. They go, can you build us a village? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I just started doing house, but yeah, I'll, I'll build you one, sure. So I know I couldn't do it myself. So I, I me, my two partners, Russell Peters Jr. and Russell Peter, Peters Sr. out of Mashby, we formed a company, company called Eastern We Too. And we hired on Mashby Wampanoag men who knew what they were doing. We hired on the Chiefy Mills. We hired on the Daryl Wixons. We hired on um, Anwan Whedon's. The Russell Russell's already there, the Clyde Peters, the Milton Hendricks. We had a core group, Hartman Dietz. We had a group of guys probably about um, Peter Hendricks, probably about 10 of us, right? And we all lived in Mashpee. We would commute from Mashpee to Pequot, two hours there, two hours back every day. We did that for a year. You guys have been to the Pequot Museum. It's the largest Native American museum in the United States. And they have a huge village inside. And think about the village inside, right? It's inside. And the bark is still good. We built this, what, going over 25 years ago. And they still say bark because the weather doesn't get to it, right? And people can't walk in, touch it, you know, it's locked off. But it's a great, it's, it's a really great exhibit. You got the bottom right being the Mashpee Museum. Um, that house right there. We have a small museum in my community. 
And I took pride in making that house because I have a lot of critics in my community, right? <laughs> a lot. So I knew once I came to my community, started building this house, I would see people coming out. The men coming out, the women coming out. They wouldn't say much. They would just sit there and watch me work. But yeah, but yeah, yeah, I'm lucky they didn't say anything. I'm glad they didn't say anything. But it's one of the houses. That house right there is a 20 footer by 16 foot in width. I just redid the beds this year out of cedar. They got cedar beds inside there. We, I did that about, I don't know, I want to say about 15 years ago. Um, there's some other houses. One other project that you don't see here is the Tannic Widget Museum in, in uh, Mohegan down in Connecticut. Reintroduce them. And think about the Mohegans, when I reintroduced it, how to do it. I was traveling down there with my wife and family, and they would put us up and treat us really nice. And they finally picked it up. And they picked it up in the first for a couple of years. I'll start telling them, showing them different phases. So it was good. It was really good to see that. Good to see that. It wasn't good for me financially. <laughs> now they knew what they were doing. So they don't meet, they don't need to rise anymore. But that, the biggest picture point happened. They, they're doing it now themselves, which is cool. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's my talk, guys. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to, free to ask. And like I said, this is my love. You know, if I can do, I try to do at least one or two of these a year myself. So you mentioned that, you know, you would take down the mats for the summer houses. Would you leave the bark on the winter houses? Good question. Yeah. Barks, the bark houses weren't dismantled at all. You might take down the mats on the inside, the furnishing on the inside. But the, when it came to the roofing and the frame left standing year round, it's like any house. So you probably wouldn't came back in the fall, you would have a pile of bark, which you might resoak a little bit and do repairs here and there. But um, that's like any other house today though. Even. Good question. And that's... So um, what cedar has abundance today as it would have been 350 years ago? So was, was, the, was it planted near where the homes were to be built or were the homes only centered around where the cedar was built? So you had the, heart of it, right? the question was, yeah, would you plant white cedar this, near this where you'd want to build a house? I still on tap still today yeah. that I know of, you know. There's a lot of areas I've been to, a lot of swamps, Carver, Dartmouth, you know, a lot all over. But um, I don't think that was an issue, finding cedars. I mean, cedars are close enough so you can build your homes. There's swamps all over the place. Today, they grow, some are still on tap, like I said, that people haven't gone in the cut. Usually we don't, we go, we don't go and clear cut everything. We, got, we leave. You know, there's one place, last, one of the last places I cut was in Dartmouth by the airport in which we brought a canoe to, and we would cut them down and put them on the canoe and I'll sit on the cedars and paddle them back over. But we know we're taking a little too much, so we stop, we don't cut there no more, so they can regrow. And also we do doing replantings too, of the white cedar, so. And other indigenous plants like um, milk, um, milk, not milk, bulrush and cattails. Cattails you can find everywhere. Bulrush a little difficult to find these days, those reeds. But it's like they say you can use maple. I've used them all, and I well, cedar is the best. It smells good, gets away the bugs, rot resistant, very pliable. Those big, big ones will, will bend. They, they may take a while, but as long as they're green, they're not going to snap on you. Accurate. Her question is whether or not the Smithsonian Museum of the American it Indian is yeah, accurate, what his feeling is on more it. More representative of the indigenous people of the Northeast. Uh, more representation of the Northeast, indigenous cultures of the Northeast, because it, it portrays, they portray a lot of the, I don't know if you want to say west of the Mississippi, and that's where a lot of people think there's only indigenous people living today. We have, because of the 1830 Removal Act, I thought we all got forced out, but there are people still here. And there are people still very strong in their culture. I'll bring up a quick story that um, 
we brought a whole bunch of native people down there back in 2010 and we went to the museum and we saw a circle of boats from the the americas right but we did not see the most common boat you would have seen in the americas being a dugout boat it's weird i'm like why we do this all the time so we made one from them and brought it down there <laughs> you know we we, we it went along with a documentary too about it but they never put it on exhibit I, I finally talked to the people last year. I go, why was that ever put on an exhibit? I go, heard somebody, somebody that cracked. And I'm like, no, we just saw it didn't crack. I go, why would you not put it on the exhibit? That was the whole principle of stuff doing it. You know? So I'm, I'm still working with them. Hopefully it's going to be on exhibit. But they got so much reproductions in their collections of originals out in Suitland, Maryland. It's unbelievable. Yes. What's the interest level of the younger generation? Yeah, I, yeah, I, no, yeah. I I work right in my community now directly. I do indirect indirect services, indirect being right in the community with the kids. Indirect, I teach the teachers to teach not travel kids, but I find my love is getting hands on. And I was talking to one kid today. He's 15 years old. And he seems to get be getting a little bit lost. And I said, to him, I go, what do you like to do? He goes, well, I like to do a lot of hands-on stuff. Right? I go, well, I'm doing this, this so in, the, in one of my elementary schools right in Mastery. Do you want to help me out with this project? Jump right at it. So it's good to see that, stuff like that. But there's a lot of 21st century, century influences on kids these days, you know? Once that little thing came out, <laughs> you know? Yeah, is there I, a worry of losing the knowledge? Because it took a long time to regain it again. It, it, like I said, our language was encouraged to be spoken. Our cultural practices was that ceremonies were encouraged to be practiced. You know, we lost a lot of our ceremonies. We lost our songs. You know, fortunately, we have our language back. And my wife's a singer. And she's making songs in our language today, which is really cool. But we don't have, we won't have the originals anymore, which stink. There's a lot of things going on. But when it came to, it comes to material culture, we regain that. We regain the adornment. We regain the how to do mats and how to do houses. But no, I don't want to say it lost because that's part of who you are. That's where you come from, you know. And once the kids, uh, people get involved, and I go, you, you say, the ones say, no, I'm not interested. I go, I guarantee you will be interested once you get your hands, once you work with us. And they get into it really good. So. But like I said, I think the biggest thing is once that little thing came out, which are kids all over and adults. Took away the time, a lot of the time away. The focus. Yeah. Um, someone online asked, uh, what about sanitation? So things like latrines, how were those managed and were they managed differently in the summer versus winter? It, it wasn't a big deal to record where you went to the bathroom back then. It, it, you had a lot of on land. Mm -hmm. you, are, you hear me talk about the of the thousand? And that body of land right there. Mm -hmm. You look at that figure today, that's in the millions. So mm -hmm. goes right back to the So where they wanted to try to where they lived, but it didn't have to be that far. Mm -hmm. you know, everything was really good, you know. I know how it was to live, how it is to live today, I know how it was to live back then. If I had a choice, mm -hmm. I would back then. You know, it's um it was a survival. I, I you know what you hear the term survival. Oh, how did I survive back then? You just didn't wake up one morning, roll over bed. Huh, what do I do today? <laughs> There's been a system set up thousands and thousands of years that was normal. It wasn't a struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and get rid of, I don't know how much that term is used today, war like the peaceful. You cannot describe any culture of people like that. The same thing, you know, it's going to wake up in the morning, let me go grab my bowl, I'm going to go kill somebody today. Mm -hmm. No. Actually, we try to prevent war if we could. We even would play games because we know if we went to war, you got to lose family members, right? We played a game on the beach, which is like rugby, made from a, a ball, which is made out of deer skin, stuff with deer hair. And the goal of the game would be two miles apart. And if you have two different communities or nations that have that huge of a difference, you get them on that field, you get that aggravation, that stress out. No rules. So there's some heavy hits in that game. You did whatever it took to get that ball across the goal. 
And we know those women on the sidelines singing songs. Is that where the first cheerleaders came from? I don't know. <laughs> but what would happen in the evening, if they didn't score that goal that day, they would have a big dinner. Talk, and by that time, they're tired. Mm -hmm. They believe a lot of that stress out on that field. And hopefully the people could talk about the differences <laughs> at that time. 70s, 80s, 90s, nothing unusual. Nothing unusual. But you look at what people ate back then. The most common beverages was water and tea, right? You saw my one of our daughters picking sumac tea. That stag home sumac has three times as much vitamin C as our orange juice does. Mm. You look at 60% being vegetables, a lot of fresh fish, a lot of fresh meat. Like the meats were different, you know? They weren't pumped up with chemicals and such. They weren't cooped up and, and slotted. The meats were lean. They can run, animals can run wherever they wanted to run. So it was a well-balanced food. See, that's the one thing. It's, it's a little different today in society. There's, there's shop corners and stoppages. It, for us as indigenous people, it's always one, one circle. It's the way you are with Mother Earth and the Creator. It's fluent. It's a huge, big picture. But sometimes I, it's hard to put my head around a lot. But yes, yeah, so all being in tune with where you're at and who you are. Yes. Thank you so much for this talk. It's been fascinating. Um, I'm still trying to get over uh, that terrible play uh, that happened uh, before the program Stephen was here. Do you have any sense or historical knowledge of what the impact must have been just so huge. You know, it, it, it was, you know, I, it, it was devastating. I still can't, you know, how huge it was huge. Nine out of 10 people, like I said, possibly mm -hmm. died, off, died off from that disease. Now, when the pilgrims landed, they were fortunate enough for, for them to land when they did. Because mm -hmm. when they get to what was known as Plymouth, that was called Patuxet. And as far as we know, most of those indigenous people, those Wampanoag, Patuxet Wampanoag were wiped out. And for us as a people, we don't believe in ownership of land. We believe that nobody lives there, go ahead and settle there. And these people brought women and children, which might have been, meant a friendlier type of people, you know? Um, someone asked uh, what evidence there, if there is any, of uh, Sakonet in Little Compton today. And Yeah, we got the Sakonet. You got, you know, Sakonet's big, the big name because you hear our shanks. Mm -hmm. Our Shanks is a, one of the, our female leaders back then. We had women chiefs back then. She becomes big in time during, during the King Philip's War. Um, she does a lot with Benjamin Church. You know, Benjamin Church wants land. She doesn't want to give back the land. And you ask her to take sides, and she's confused. Her son brings her to court, come up following her about illegal land sales. It gets messy. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big story with. Our Shunks, very powerful leader. And that's the thing. We had Weedemos, another woman leader, who was Wampanoag for Pacasset. Uh, so it was the past our father, the son, and all the parents who was capable of affirming the government back then. Yeah. Um, what we have in our book, um, that was the, the first half um, up to 1820, was. Um, because there were fewer men in the population, there may have been more um, intermarriage. And at that point, very oddly exact senses of who was, like they may have been labeled as English or as African <clears throat> because they married either into an English family or a black family. Um, yeah, look at who's writing the things too. Right. Right. Um, yeah, so you got to look at these, these sources, these primary sources. Yep. And they're looking from their lens. Yep. And what they're saying, because I know when the English first got here, they didn't look highly upon the women. Mm -hmm. They didn't write a lot about our women. Right. right? That's why you, in history, you don't hear too many women's names out there for indigenous people. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't important at that time for them to write about. Them. Right. They dealt with the men. Yep. They would say, they said Massoy had five wives. But what they're looking at could have been different. They would go make go Massoy's house and count the people and who they might be counting as sisters, mm -hmm. be an aunt, being a wife or a mm -hmm. grandmother. They're comparing their culture against our culture. Mm -hmm. English culture at the time was husband, wife, kids. Mm -hmm. 
our cultures, husband and wife are inside of a house, husband and wife, kids, grandparents, their grandparents, uncles mm -hmm. and aunts. Yeah. So the person who was recording what they, it was a English descended clerk who was deciding how to record people. Yeah. Um, and so they, they may have recorded them other than how the person themselves would have identified. Um, and in 1827, um, in the newspaper was the death of the last Sakonet. Um, and what standard were they using? Um, and so uh, knowing that it's, it's probable that there are still people there are. who identify there are. as Sakonet. And uh, so yeah, yeah, it's what? much more complicated than it Seems. People, people are fascinated with the first, and people are fascinated with the last. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's like I do. I do a lot of work over Nantucket, and there's two last Wampanoags living on in Nantucket within months apart. Mm. I go, there's a, there were other people there. That's what they knew about. Mm -hmm. Other people didn't have to be out in the limelight. You know, that were doing their own thing. They're living their own ways. Okay. But that's what people are so much fascinated today about the last and the first. Yeah. So I. I had posted on our um, Facebook page um, the experiences of experienced Tobe, and she was married to an enslaved man, and they lived in uh, a we too. Um, yeah, people. We have um, a couple other Afro Indigenous families that we've done research on. So they're. Yeah, this we too went through 1700s, 1800s, even early 1900s. People had we twos. Mm -hmm. And you got the later on we twos. So you see the English, you see furnishing inside there. So you see the chairs, you see the desk. You even see in some of these houses, you see the window, windows. Mm. I think Ezra Stiles, who was at Yale University back in the 1700s, he does a lot of descriptions of the houses during that time. Of the mm. Once you cut a window into the side of the reeds, though, it's not going to bark. drain as well. Probably will, I would see it use bark, the bark itself. Yeah. You cut the bark and you can put a window right in there. Huh. You see about English doors. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and for many, many questions tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Top you. Dash, thank you for having me come on the guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody on Zoom too, thank you for participating. And good questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.